is Angela with Parkos Permaculture. Welcome back to House Row Friday. This is a special bonus video. So please go watch the main video. I was cutting together some TikToks that I made this week specifically about unschooling and some claims one specific parent was making about unschooling, one specific social media influencer was making. And in the course of doing that, I realized that I have made a lot of TikToks this week about unschooling. And so I want to cut those together here for those of you that are not on TikTok, because I think they are all relevant and helpful and have useful information in them. And then also, if you are on TikTok, please go follow me at Parkers Permaculture. That would be amazing. I have increased my following sixfold in the last week, and I'm really hoping maybe there's a chance I could get to 10,000 followers and monetize that channel, which would be great because then I could get compensated for some of the work I do. Um, if you are on TikTok and you want me to talk about unschooling in short, you know, one minute, two minute segments, please ask your questions. Please let me know what you want me to cover. And if there are more in-depth topics of unschooling that you want for longer videos like here on YouTube, drop those in the comments below. Are all unschoolers woo-tastic weirdos with fringe beliefs? Hi, my name is Angela and I'm an unschool mom with four kids. My three eldest are now in college. While folks with fringe beliefs exist in every homeschool group and in the public school system, I've never met an unschooler like this. Yes, some unschoolers can tend a little bit crunchy hippie, and I've met some who are anti-vax. Our family is very pro-vax, we're very COVID cautious, we're very pro-public health. And so are most of the unschool families that I know. I've never met a homophobic unschooler. In fact, our social settings are one of the most queer-friendly spaces you can find, and I struggle to think of any fellow homeschoolers that don't have queer kids in their family. In fact, a number of our unschooling friends came to it because they left more conservative homeschool circles when they had kids come out to them. So also definitely not creationists. We're definitely pro-science. Also, someone who doesn't want their kids to have access to the truth is not an unschooler. That mindset is antithetical to unschooling. So was it hard for my unschooled kids to adjust to college? My three eldest kids were unschooled their entire lives until they went to college and my youngest is only 15. We have discussed this a bunch, so even though all of them are either in class or working on homework right now, I am able to answer from their perspective. They would all say there are two things that were difficult when adjusting to college. The first one is busy work. Unschoolers have a very low threshold for wasting their time and doing meaningless busy work. They have found a lot of requirements for some of their classes tedious and unnecessary and uneducational. So that's been a learning curve, maybe more in forbearance than anything. And then the second thing is dogmatic behavior from professors. They've had some great professors and then they've had some that feel the need to flex their authority and have really unrealistic expectations, including no extensions when kids were very sick with COVID, but then taking off sick days themselves when they had COVID. Learning that some profs won't treat you with respect and have a double standard has definitely been a learning curve. So do our children require the discipline and structure of the public education system? So please go watch my video where I talk about how the American school system was actually crafted to turn our children into compliant worker bees for the assembly line. So yes, it is about discipline and getting your kids to follow a set structure and to be obedient and compliant. But you may not know that our children don't need that kind of structure. And we actually only very recently as a species have had that structure for our kids. The model of schooling that we have in America only came about in the early 19th century. We don't know anything different, so we think that this is how kids have to be raised because it's how we were raised and our parents and grandparents were as well. But our current educational model comes out of a system that began in the 1740s and 50s and was actually about creating obedient soldiers who would win wars because they would do anything for their commandant. And we use it to get kids to submit to the government and to their bosses at work. I know you didn't mean it this way, but you're absolutely right. The model of public schooling that we have in America was absolutely created to mold and shape today's children into compliant workers for tomorrow's assembly line. Submission to authority, the bell schedule, not having control over your own body and having to ask permission in order to get a drink of water or use the restroom, set meal times, whether or not that's when you're actually hungry. I minored in education, so I know a little bit about this subject. But also, the first school that my husband ever taught for was a large public school district in Washington State. And when you would call the office, the answering machine would say, 
Hello, welcome to Blah 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 School District, Shaping Tomorrow's Model Citizens. Our goal for our kids' education was not simply to create more cogs in the machine of capitalism, but I'm glad you brought this up. It's important to know what our school system is based on. Hey, Ann Palmer Wesco, you think my kids are gonna go to prison because they did not experience the structure and discipline of the public school. So let's talk about the school to prison pipeline. So the rest of y'all, please click on this comment to see the original video where she made this assertion. The rigid, militaristic, inflexible structure of our public schools actually increases the risk of our kids going to prison, especially children of color and children with learning disabilities. This juvenile justice and civil rights issue is called the school to prison pipeline. So let's look at that a little more closely. The school to prison pipeline refers to the policies and practices that push our nation's school children, especially our most at risk children, out of classrooms and into the juvenile and criminal justice systems. This pipeline reflects the prioritization of incarceration over education. So what does that mean? In struggling public schools where teachers are overburdened and administration is focused on control rather than education, schools have implemented zero tolerance policies and they have increased the number of safety officers at their school. Students are suspended or expelled for minor infractions such as bringing scissors or nail clippers to school or for manifestations of their disability, which is actually illegal under federal law. Rapidly increasing expulsion rates for relatively minor infractions are the entryway to this pipeline. Kids' needs are not being met in schools, they're not being supported, and not only that, they're being booted out. And these overly harsh disciplinary practices push students down the pipeline and into the juvenile justice system. Suspended and expelled children are often left unsupervised and without constructive activities. They also fly, fall behind in their coursework, leading to a greater likelihood of disengagement and dropping out. The presence of school resource officers, that is police officers in our schools with our kids, leads to a greater risk of children being arrested and charged with crimes for things that previously would have been disciplinary issues handled within the school. I mean, if you go to a barber, you're gonna get a haircut. You bring a cop into a school, you're gonna have more escalation and more arrests. In one state, up to 80% of court-involved children did not have a lawyer to represent them for these minor infractions. The activities were as minor as missing school or disobeying a teacher. And for that, they ended up in juvie. By the way, these students are far more likely to be students of color and far more likely to have disabilities. So if we wanna talk about doing right by our kids, setting them up for success and keeping them out of the prison system, we need to address the school to prison pipeline, the way it is a civil rights and disability rights and child rights issue, the way it harms everybody in our society. I encourage you to do more reading on the school to prison pipeline issue rather than spending your time leaving ridiculous comments like these. Are unschoolers chronically behind their public school peers? This public school teacher made that assertion on one of my videos where I talked about how I have unschooled my four children and my eldest three are now in college all getting 4.0s. Forgive the wet hair I just got out of the shower, but I wanted to address this issue really quickly because I think it is very important when public school teachers or folks who are products of the public school system make confident claims about unschoolers and other homeschoolers. What this teacher is experiencing is something called sampling bias. So sampling bias occurs when instead of taking a random and representative sample from the target population, you end up taking a select sample. The unschoolers that public school teachers interact with are those that have struggled in unschooling and are returning to or entering the public school system. You are seeing the select few for whom unschooling didn't work or whose parents failed to implement it correctly. So it's impossible to make claims about unschooling as a whole or about the kids who successfully unschool because you don't interact with them. So what do folks mean when they say that homeschool kids are behind their public school peers? Hi, my name's Angela. I have unschooled my four kids their entire lives. My eldest three are now college students, all with 4.0 GPAs. I minored in education and I taught at a private school before I had kids and my husband is a public school mathematics special education teacher. First off, I think it's really important for anybody in the homeschool community to acknowledge that educational neglect does exist and it is a significant problem in this space. It doesn't help kids to pretend that it doesn't happen. And I understand when academics want to assess success for children in a varying range of educational styles and modes that they need to stick to a narrow range of variables. 
But one question that I consistently try to raise when the issue of academic performance comes up, when we look at homeschoolers and public schoolers, is why are we only measuring academic success on the same scale that is used in the public school system? Okay, so I guess that's technically two things, but let's take a look at the first one. A lot of the reason that folks homeschool their kids is to give them a diverse range of social and life experiences that you can't get when stuck in an age stratified classroom for eight hours a day. And I'm not talking about the people who homeschool because they're afraid of the world. That's not what I'm talking about. So if we could isolate for fearful homeschoolers who are often extreme religious homeschoolers, that would be great. A lot of folks homeschool because their children have special needs and they feel that their needs are not being met and their kids are not getting appropriate accommodations and support in the public school setting. And that that is causing trauma, shame, and a resistance to learning. Folks also want to give their kids a wider range of social interactions and cultural experiences than they can get in public school. And none of those things are assessed when we look at the studies comparing academic performance. There's a lot more that goes into raising a healthy, well-adjusted child with minimal trauma and the potential to pursue what they want in life than strictly their academics, not that their academics aren't important. The second thing is that public school kids and homeschool kids rarely learn things at the exact same time. For example, when my 15-year-old was 11, he spent an entire year going down a rabbit hole of Greek mythology, myths, legends, folklore from around the world. He did a ton of reading and learned a ton of history through that experience. Because he was so intensely focused on something that was meaningful to him, he got what you would consider behind on math. But he ended up far ahead of his peers in terms of history, literature, world geography, art history. I could go on. And then he caught up on the math when it was meaningful and important to him. In fact, he tested in two grades above grade level when he began an early college program this year. Another anecdotal example here is my 19-year-old who wants to be an attorney. She started college knowing far more than any of her peers about Supreme Court case law, all kinds of case history from Oregon, legal theory, civil rights issues, and American history than your average 18-year-old. But that means that she had studied less science during her high school years than her older sister, who is a science major now. I am very pro-science and like, yes, let's look at the peer-reviewed literature, but let's also understand that there's limitations, especially when we're looking at niche groups like homeschoolers that face face a lot of stigma and also that are so incredibly diverse that you really can't lump them all in together. Because Fundy homeschoolers a la Duggar family have an entirely different life and an entirely different way of approaching learning than my kids do. And my kids have had the freedom to explore some subjects far more in depth than they would otherwise. And that means that they might have catch up in some other areas when they enter formal education in college and beyond. And that's okay. Because ultimately, my goal was to raise well-adjusted children who know their own minds and are able to access learning on their own. I want happy, functional kids, and unschooling was the best way for us to get that for them. We all know the phrase, weird, unsocialized homeschoolers. So are homeschoolers lacking in socialization? Hi, my name is Angela. I am an unschool mom of four children. My three eldest children are in college. My kids are ages 21, 19, almost 16, and almost 13. The most common pushback that you will hear from folks who have never homeschooled is that homeschoolers lack socialization. If I had a nickel for every time some well-meaning person, or not well-meaning, asked me or my children, but how do you deal with the socialization issue? Public school children are stuck in an age-stratified classroom for seven or eight hours a day, where their only interaction is with people of exactly their same age and adults who are automatically set up as authority figures. That's not how we will socialize once we get out in the real world, and it's not how humans have socialized for the majority of our existence. Now let's set aside those fearful homeschoolers who are doing it because they're afraid of the world. Yes, those kids are going to be under-socialized, but they're not the majority. Folks who are homeschooling well do it because they want their kids to have greater social interaction and experience community with a broad range of ages and social backgrounds. I know for us as unschoolers, one of the great benefits has been that my kids have no trouble interacting with adults. They don't see adults as authority figures. They see them as other human beings they're in community with. 
Adults were often shocked when my children were not intimidated to interact with them and had no problem carrying on conversations with them because they don't have this artificial structure that the only adults you interact with are authority figures. They also have no trouble playing with kids younger and older than them. And also, they're able to interact with folks out in society who they would never encounter while they are stuck in public school. And one of the big differences for us has been the way that my kids have had the opportunity to interact with the elderly to learn from folks of all different generations and to learn to interact with them as fellow human beings. That is the kind of socialization that homeschoolers get if they're doing it well. If you are homeschooling well with a focus on diversity and raising a child who is well adjusted and able to go out into the world and navigate our society, you are providing a greater level of socialization than they could ever hope to get in the age stratified classroom of the public school. I have zero worries about my kids' social skills. Okay, thank you so much for watching. I hope those videos were helpful for you. Please, please click like and subscribe. And don't forget to go follow me on TikTok at Parker's Permaculture. Thanks.